Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to you from all over the world. It's great to see you putting in chat uh, where you're listening in from. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening. Uh, and thank you for joining us in the latest in our uh, Innovation at Work uh, Need to Know webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Today, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, my colleague, Miro Kazakov, who is a senior lecturer in managerial communication at MIT Sloan School. Uh, and he's going to be sharing with us today his uh, work uh, on, with a presentation about the curse of knowledge and why smart professionals uh, sometimes struggle to explain their work. And so today we're going to have a very smart uh, professional actually explaining his work very effectively. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing this webinar myself as well. I need all the help I can get on this topic too. Uh, Miro is one of our most uh, acclaimed teachers at the MIT Sloan School, has won many awards for uh, his uh, teaching on uh, this and other topics. Uh, so we're very pleased he's been able to find time uh, to join us uh, today for this talk. And it's a little bit of a preview as well for those of you that have been signing up for the new executive education uh, online course that uh, Miro is uh, going to be chairing uh, next month. So welcome, Miro. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, and I think we've got one more slide before we uh, hand over to you, uh, which is just a reminder, uh, as you all signed up, you know this, of what we're going to be covering. Uh, but with that, uh, let me hand over to Miro, and I'll be back uh, a little later to uh, help uh, facilitate some questions that are coming in. We have over 2,300 registrants on this webinar. So please do keep the questions coming and we'll get to them shortly. But Miro, uh, please take it away. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you everyone for joining me. I will bring up my screen. Excellent. All right. So uh, as Peter said, the things that I want to share with you today is that by the end of just a few minutes that I'm going to talk for, that you're going to have a chance to better understand how the human brain processes new information, why experts actually tend to be poorer communicators in their own domains than non-experts do, unless they've had some really specific training and practice that does not come naturally. It's actually a skill that needs to be developed. And one thing that I think all professionals can do to be more effective, there are many things, but I've picked out one that I've found to be really, really helpful and kind of the lead domino that tends to tip other ones. So let's talk about how the human brain processes new information. And I'm gonna zoom out here to start at the, at the highest level of what is communication. And I wanna to offer to you one definition of communication. And those of you who have engineering backgrounds will be familiar with some of these ideas from a slightly different domain, which is an idea that communication is a process of encoding, then transmitting, and then decoding information. So you wanna think about all of these ideas and this information that you have in your head and that you have conceptualized in your head. And then when we need to communicate with someone else, what we do is we encode that information in actually a, a much more restricted channel. So we basically have two ways that we can transmit information, you know, the kinds of information we talk about in the workplace to other, either visually, so that can be through words that we write or pictures that we draw, maybe in the form of graphs, or of through sounds in the form of words that we say. And that process of converting your ideas into words or sounds, that's encoding of information and the process, it's then transmitted through light waves and audio waves through the air. And on the other side, as the recipient, what you do is you decode that information. You take in through your visuals, through your eyes, or sounds through your ears, and your brain decodes that back into information. And that essentially, I believe that every communication problem that we have happens in this process, in this process of encoding and decoding information. And I want to go ahead and actually do a little experiment with you. And what I'm gonna do here is in a moment, I'm gonna put an encoding up here. And what I'd like folks to do is head on over into chat. And when I put this encoding up here, just to type into chat, what is the first thing that your brain decodes this to? This is called metacognition. It's what we think about thinking. And so I want you to notice just right when things hit your eyes with this encoding, 
What does it decode to? Go ahead, type that into chat. Don't overthink it. Just really try to notice that very, very first thing. All right, ready? Here we go. All right, I'm gonna put it up. All right, that. So head on over to chat. What do we see? People come in on chat. We see pause, two, parallel lines, 11, pause, equal, pipes, pause, 11, or logic, MIT, doors, speech marks, lots and lots of different things for this reasonably simple encoding. There's not a lot to this. I'm gonna put up a second encoding now, and I want you to go through the same thing. Just really try to notice right when this hits your eye, what does this decode to for you? So again, second one up here, again, head on over into chat. Don't overthink it, just really try to notice what happens right when this hits your eye. All right, here. And chat comes in much, much faster this time. Um, what a couple of people have said, and when we're in person and live, what almost everyone responds to is when they see this encoding, they say that they see the number two. And what I actually wanna point out is that this is not the number two. Technically, this is the numeral two. It is a very specific squiggle developed by Arabic scholars designed to encode some idea of Tunis that exists in the universe. And it's an encoding that we are so familiar with. And so I've been, I've been learned from such a young age that it decodes to this concept of two almost immediately for everyone. And so much so we tend to fuse them in our brain. And I just want you to sort of separate them a little bit conceptually in your brain. All right, I'm gonna show another encoding up here. And again, same process, notice what happens right when it hits your eyes. What does it decode to for you? So third encoding here. Okay, right. what do folks see in chat? I see equal sign, road, pyramid, um, equal sign, semiotics, a couple of people, um, ground, lines, uneven parallel bars. Notice this takes a lot longer to decode. There's a really high variety of decoding in here, but there's a couple of people who you saw in chat who this decoded to very, very quickly. Because this is the Chinese character to represent the number two. And so if you've been exposed to this since birth, it's gonna decode to two just as quickly as this Arabic numeral two is going to. All right, last one. I'm gonna put up one more in here. Same process, notice what happens. All right, what did that decode to for you? And really quickly, there's a couple of people coming in, coming in on chat. I'm trying to just expand my chat here. There's a couple of people coming in on chat and then much slower for everybody else. Because this is also an encoding for an idea of two. Um, based on what I've understood from uh, native Chinese speakers is that this character encodes what in English, probably the closest word is the idea of a pair, as in two things, a pair of things together. And so all of these are encodings for two. There's the Arabic numeral two, the Roman numeral two, the simplified Chinese character for two, and the Chinese character for the word two in the sense of a pair which is actually a slightly different form of Tunis. Some people had very complex decodings that they see when they see this that happen very, that happen very quickly as well. And this is the challenge of encoding and decoding. It is the challenge that one brain, the author, yours, encodes information many, many different minds decode that information. And there's a tremendous variety of factors that influence decoding. As you saw in here, people's prior experience significantly impacted it, context did. So once I showed the Arabic numeral two, a lot of people changed their, saw that the second one was an encoding for the Roman numeral two. When I put that one up first, what, so when I do it in the opposite order, I put the Roman numeral up for, sorry, the Arabic numeral up first, Almost everyone decodes the Roman numeral to two. 
biological factors can influence how people decode in the case of things like colorblindness. And so part of the challenge that we have as professionals, and one of the issues we have in how the human brain processes new information is that we process to a tremendous degree, much higher than people realize, based on the context that we come into the situation with. And so when you're communicating to other people, the variety of contexts that they come with can make it hard, or, or I should say, can highly influence how they decode things. And decodings that seem obvious to us can be difficult or misinterpreted for other people. And so one of the critical challenges of professional communication is to recognize and internalize the variety of ways that people decode things so that you can encode so that you can choose encodings that are more reliable, that more people more reliably decode them in the way you want them to more of the time. And it's a real skill because different people and different audiences and different backgrounds can actually have dramatically different ways that they decode the same information. And so that's one of the critical challenges for communication in terms of how the human brain processes information how context dependent we are when we take information in. Every mind decodes differently. There's another issue in communication that shows up all the time that actually doesn't have to do with our audiences, but has to do with us, something that's inside of us. And it's something called the curse of knowledge. I'm going to illustrate it first and then talk a little bit more about it. So I'm going to put another decoding on here. And this is going to be far more complicated than the prior decoding that you saw. But I think you're going to decode it pretty quickly. So again, put it up here and I'll show it to you and see what you decode it to. And then we can, we can, um, we can go into chat and put on it. I'm pausing just because I see there's something in chat, which is a really interesting issue. I'd ask you to put that into uh, the Q&A so that we can have a sense of upvoting it and I can address it when we get to the questions there because it's a really important issue that I think is worth talking about. So I'm going to put that encoding up here. And again, just pop into chat. What does this decode to for you right as you see it? All right. What do people see here? Don't overthink it. Come in as a rose. Yep. Rose, rose, flower. Again, much more complicated than before, but still decodes really reliably. What I haven't seen in chat is that no one here has put in dolphin, that they see a dolphin. And you might see it now that I'm priming you a little better. I'll give you a little closer look at it here and see if you see the dolphin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the dolphin here. It's right here. And then I'm going to go back. Uh, uh. So notice, once you see the dolphin in here, it is impossible to unsee it. Once you see that the dolphin is there, you can't fail to see it. And this is because of something called the curse of knowledge, which is that when we see a pattern or recognize something or, or know something, it's different than forgetting, but we sort of know something, we forget what it was like before we knew that thing. We can't unsee the dolphin. And this is why experts struggle to communicate about their own domain to non-experts, because there is a tremendous amount of context and things that we know that curse us, that the knowledge that we have curses us to make it hard for us to recognize what it was like before we knew what we now know, and to put ourselves in the shoes of people who don't know what we know. And this phenomenon of the curse of knowledge happens very, very fast, as quickly as this dolphin example, and tends to affect experts in a domain more highly than novices. So unfortunately, the more expertise you develop in a domain, the worse the curse of knowledge becomes with you. <laughs> Someone is talking about their relationship with their spouse. Almost all communications classes at some point devolve that I've taught devolve into like some version of interpersonal relationships. Um, and the answer is all related to the context that we have. So we have to work really hard when we are trying to 
communicate information that we have to people who don't have the same level of expertise that we have. And we don't always notice it because often in our close in work groups, we talk to people with very similar levels of expertise. And so the curse of knowledge is less of an issue. But as you move out to talk to other groups within your companies, senior managers, external clients and stakeholders, this becomes really, really important. And the curse of knowledge, we struggle what it was like to remember before we knew what we now know. And so why are experts poor communications often in their own domains? It's because of the curse of knowledge. So those are really conceptual ideas. I wanna zoom now into one super duper specific tactical thing. There are many different tactical things um, and tools that we can talk about that require practice. But I wanna give you just one that's really practical. And this speaks to actually a phenomenon specifically related to slide presentations because so many professionals communicate in slide presentations. What I wanna to suggest to you to help you combat the curse of knowledge and help your encodings be more reliably decoded to the audience is about how you write this text up here on the very top of your slides. And what I wanna suggest that you think about doing is not labeling your slides. Uh, this is, uh, in, uh, I work in data visualization and communications. This is as close as we have to a joke in data visualizations is that pie charts look like Pac-Man. Um, and often what we see, I see this tremendously in academia, is people just label their slides. They sort of label what the topic of the content is. What I want to encourage you to do instead, because I've seen this make a tremendous difference, is to actually use this space at the top of the slide for what I'll call a headline. There's not a common name for it, but I'll call it a headline to encourage you to think about using this to explain what the point of the data is. To explain when you're presenting a slide, what is the most important idea here? Or if you're showing a graph, what is the thing you want this audience to take from the slide? And in order to do that, you have to decide first what the point of this data is for the audience. And then you can write it in a headline. And this I have found actually is one of those simple to understand, somewhat difficult to do, but tremendously powerful impacts that you can have on your audience. Because it forces you to decide what the point is and it makes it much more easier for the audience to decode because they understand why you're showing them the data. And so they can actually, I mean, it helps fight the curse of knowledge because there may be patterns in the data that are very obvious to you because of the curse of knowledge that aren't obvious to other people. And this allows your audience to be to say, ah, I see, that's what you're trying to convey here. And then they can inspect the data for that thing. It has another nice effect that if you do it, the audience will tend to look at the data for this issue in it, and they'll be less likely to ask you off topic questions. I cannot eliminate off topic questions for you. It is not going to be that powerful an effect, but it does tend to focus the audience better. As someone points out, there's a lot of names for this bottom line up front, answer first, um, headline driven or action driven slides. We'll see this idea in a lot of places because it's so powerful. And if you're wondering um, what is a headline, a headline makes the point. There is still a place on your slides for the title if you have a graph. And the test of whether or not you have a headline is generally, is there a verb? There, there's some exceptions to this, but as a general rule, if there's a verb on your in, in your headline, then it's actually a headline rather than a title. So that's your very quick test. Um, what this also lets you do is, if your headlines have a verb, is you can create presentations that pass the narrative test. And the narrative test is, if you were to thumb through a presentation and just read the headlines, that you would understand what the point that the presenter is trying to make is. And if you agreed with all of those headlines, that you would accept the conclusion that the presenter is trying to make towards you. So good headlines pass the verb test, and they allow you to create presentations that create the, that pass the narrative test. And so what can all professionals do? One thing that you can do is identify a key point for every slide and write it as a headline. So those are 
That's how the human brain processes new information. I wanna highlight this idea that every mind decodes differently. That's why experts are poor communicators often in their own domain because they suffer from the curse of knowledge. And we have to fight that curse. And one thing that almost all professionals can do to be better is to identify the point and write it out as the headline. These are actually surprisingly difficult skills to master. And so I do recommend practice on them, practicing with your colleagues. Obviously we have courses here at MIT, but different ways that you can think about actually going through and doing cycles of this to help make it into a process and a, and a framework and a reference point um, that gets better as you work with it. So that ends my formal content of this and we'll move over to some time um, for, I understand that we have some questions. Great, thank you, Mary. We've been getting a lot of questions and comments coming in as well. And maybe I could just join a couple up to, to start with. Uh, I think a lot of people were finding this idea of a headline in a presentation uh, very helpful. And a question is, uh, how do you, how does that concept show up when you're not giving a presentation with slides, but you know, in a, a meeting or a conversation? So the way it shows up in a meeting or a conversation is to think about beforehand, actually distilling what you're going to say into these sort of key points or headlines. So the way I think about it is um, most presentations have too many slides in them. People talk faster. They don't cut back their ideas. But generally, you want to think about what are cutting back your core ideas. And before you go into these meetings as a best practice, I want to encourage you to actually physically write them down. I actually find it's helpful to write them longhand. The time that it takes to do that will force you to consolidate your thinking. And then in the meeting, you will be more likely to say the sort of coherent, thought out main point because you took that mental energy beforehand to write it, even if you never look at the, those notes again. Right, that's very helpful. Um, another question that uh, I, I see here, uh, quite relevant to us at MIT, I suppose, speaks to oftentimes the knowledge that is the curse is of a very scientific or technical kind of uh, nature. And yet you know, we need to communicate those to uh, business colleagues or to uh, you know, customers or other people in, in, in society. And is that a different kind of curse of knowledge? Uh, no, that is, when we talk about the curse of knowledge, that is the curse of knowledge at its most powerful, which is, you have one group of people who've been trained in a specific domain that actually has very specific rules for how we communicate it. So if you've been trained in science or engineering or math or technology, you've actually been trained in a really structured, in a structured way to communicate that uses certain language rules and has certain technical terms that you have probably studied since high school or even college and really internalized that are not necessarily known or well used to other people who may have studied some of them, but don't use them on the same daily basis that you do. And that one of the things I've seen often frustrate engineers and scientists is uh, because they have learned to communicate so precisely with such specific language, it's actually very hard to use different language. Because if you went to your colleagues and used it, you would sound unprofessional. And the sort of fear of that, I think, um, actually can limit people when they're talking to other audiences to think about how do I frame this in a way that's more um, in line with their context and their background. So that is, that is the classic example of the curse of knowledge, um, is, is the engineer scientist talking to the senior business leader and it just going like that. <laughs> So another question which relates to that, uh, which, which I saw over here in the Q&A, and please do keep them coming, we've got a few minutes left, is uh, this sounds like a very uh, rational appro approach, and you know, we're talking about people, we just talk about scientists and technologists, maybe we tend, we tend to be very rational, uh, but what have you got, what advice have you got about uh, the emotional uh, component of communicating? Yeah. Um... That's a tremendously broad question. And so I'm trying to zero in on one aspect of it. Um, I think for the engineers and scientists that I have worked with, one of the things to think about doing is um, actually two things. One is to abstract, 
is to abstract more. So to think about for the audience that you have, how does this impact, how does this information impact them? And really try to figure out what is that impact? And that'll help you figure out what they care about. And so in that sense, to generalize more and be more abstract and talk much more about impact. On the other side is also one of the things that demonstrates expertise is our ability to generalize. But actually, generalizations can be very hard for non-expert audiences. We're much better as humans at going from the specific to the general. So the other side of that advice is abstract really highly so that you have, that you have the high-level impact, but also pick out specific examples. And I have been called out over in the chat. I just noticed for some of you here, I do have a Canadian accent. I was, uh, I was born in Montreal. Um, so this is one of my verbal encoding problems is that I do that. Um, I also do the up speak a little bit that us Canadians do. So for scientists, think about abstracting more to what is the impact, but also going to very, very specific examples as a way to illustrate your point. That will work much better with non-expert audiences. Great, thank you. And actually, I think you answered a number of questions that people had related to that topic. So you honed in on it uh, perfectly. Uh, we're almost uh, out of time uh, now. Unfortunately, there are lots of questions uh, that are still coming in. Uh, so uh, we will follow up with you, Mira, with all the questions and find a way to try to get the answers out uh, to some of the other questions as uh, when we send out the recording. Of course, uh, we also, as I mentioned at the beginning, have your course uh, coming up uh, next month in executive education. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you would just like to, to give me a sort of a 30 second uh, intro to uh, to what else you, you cover in that course that you think might be relevant to some of the questions that you've been seeing here today. Yeah. So this class is going to be, this is modeled on the class that we teach here at MIT Sloan um, to executives and working professionals. It's a really practical class called Persuading with Data that's very, very practice oriented. So in the mornings, we'll talk about some content and theory, but actually you'll bring in a slide that you are going to present in the future and actually have a chance to learn some of the frameworks. We'll talk about how to present data-oriented slides in ways that fight the curse of knowledge and create more reliable decoding, as well as designing them. You'll have a chance to practice that, as well as get feedback and revise that and present it again. We'll also talk about this abstracting process. How do you think about taking technical data and creating these abs these further levels of abstraction that are going to be understandable to audiences and we'll be practicing all of those skills so you won't just be learning about them you'll actually have a chance to demonstrate them get feedback and actually work on real problems that you're currently facing in your work uh, that's fantastic very exciting we're looking forward to it and hopefully some people who joined us today will be able to take advantage of, of that opportunity uh, as well uh, thank you again, uh, Miro Kasikov, for this fascinating uh, introduction to, to this topic. Uh, we do have a, a, another webinar lined up uh, as well, uh, coming up shortly, so keep an eye out for uh, that. That's uh, all about entrepreneurship, uh, and in particular, entrepreneurial strategy, which may be two words that you might not instinctively think together from an encoding standpoint, but actually our colleagues Scott Stern and Aaron Scott uh, are going to show us that indeed entrepreneurialism and strategy are two words that very much belong together. Uh, so please do keep an eye out for that and sign up and join us for that upcoming webinar. Just remains for me to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Miro Kasikov, once more uh, for this fascinating talk. And uh, everyone, please uh, be safe and keep on innovating. <laughs>